One of the most important things I've learned over the last 20-some years is that each congregation is as unique as the individual members are that are in it. But having said that, though, all churches seem to have something in common right now. They're trying to understand who they are in the world and society today and how they can best be the church. Now, while the message of the church may not have changed, the world around us has. And it can be a source of tension as we try and figure out our direction because for some reason, doing church the way we've always done it just doesn't seem to do the same kind of results as we'd had before. Whenever we have a kind of discussion about what that amounts to, there tends to be two questions that come to the surface, and that is, who has the best ideas for the congregation and how do we deal with each other when we disagree? If you look at today's scripture lesson from the epistles, you find a Corinthian church that in some aspects we should have a lot in common with. They were a congregation that was vibrant, alive with the power of the Holy Spirit, it says the people were all blessed with all kinds of gifts and talents. People were speaking in tongues, prophesying, healing during services of worship. But questions began to arise for their congregation too. They wanted to know whose gift was highest and whose was best. Which gift was going to be given priority in worship? I mean, do we sit back and just, maybe we could just sit back and listen to the choir because their gift is most important. Or if somebody wants to prophesy, maybe we should listen to them because they're the ones that are most important. These issues started to cause division in the Corinthian church, and Paul was trying to help them through that situation. His full response is found throughout the chapters 12 through 14 in 1 Corinthians. And in his letter, he works to bring unity to a congregation. And so he begins by taking the focus off themselves and putting them back where it belongs, the source of their gifts. Now, there are a variety of gifts, he writes, but the same spirit. Varieties of services, but the same Lord. Varieties of activities, but the same God who activates them in everyone. All of these gifts are given for the common good of the people. And God gives all of them. Three times, Paul uses a different Greek verb to declare that God not only gave all the gifts, but arranged them so that the members of the congregation would not have the same gifts. We can assume that Paul understood diversity to be the church's plan, according to God. You know, for someone who probably never took a course in psychology or group dynamics, Paul does an incredible job of diverting his congregation's attention to the spirit instead of the individuals. Paul reminds them that God's the one who's given each person their gifts. In essence, Paul is saying, listen, God is creative. God is active. To be made in the image of God is to be creative and active. The church has been given a rich diversity of gifts, which can open the door for many possibilities if they're used for good. And according to Paul, God gives us this diversity for the very purpose of unity, which doesn't seem to make sense in the world we live in. It's a hard concept for us to kind of understand because and we think that sometimes if you're going to have unity, you ought to have to have uniformity. And we live in a world where nations are being torn apart over racial tensions, nationalism, religious differences. It seems like the whole world has fallen prey to this kind of thinking. There are so many countries around the world, it doesn't make a difference whether you're in the Middle East, whether you're in the Far East, or whether you're here in the Americas. You'll find people trying to find uniformity through race, through religion. In the United States, our political arena has become so divided, it's hard to imagine we could ever move towards unity again. And within Christianity, the church is split into more and more denominations. You realize that there are more Christian denominations in the United States than there are in the entire rest of the world. Because somebody else always has a better idea of how they think it should be done. It looks like the whole world thinks that in order to have unity, you first have to get uniform in your thinking, and it just never happens. But in Corinthians, Paul says just the opposite is true. 
And by using the image of the human body, he shows that in order to have unity, there must be diversity. The body doesn't consist of one member, but of many. The foot, the hand, the ear, the eye, all are part of the body. And he asked the question, if all were a single member, what would the body be? What if even one member of the body said, they don't need me? Then Paul asks the same question and reminds us it was God who arranged the body in the first place. And God knew that every part was needed. Those parts that seem weaker are really indispensable. And those members of the body we think less honorable are clothed with greater honor. The point is that what keeps the body functioning properly is precisely the need of each member of the other. There's an old joke about the parts of the body uh, fighting over which one was more important. And the eye said, well, of course I'm the most important. I'm the one that sees. And if I'm not working, you won't know where you're going. And the ear says, ah, no, 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 no. I'll just pick up the slack. If you're not working, the ears will take care of it because we're the most important after all. As long as you can hear, you can know what's going on. Oh, no, 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 the hand said, no, not at all. You, you need the touch that we have. And the feet are piping up saying, no, we're the ones that propel you and get you places. And all the different parts of the body are sticking out saying, they're the most important one when the lowly sphincter muscle <laughs> says, I think I'm pretty important. And I'll prove it. I'll just shut down for a while. And after about a week, the rest of the parts of the body agreed the sphincter muscle was actually quite important. <laughs> the thing is, all parts of the body are important, and that's the same thing about the church. If you've ever broken an arm or a leg, you know what I mean. I had a woman in one congregation who fell, broke her wrist, and after some f fall, she had to spend some time in transitional care because she wasn't able to take care of herself at home. Now, everyone thought, well, all she did was break her wrist. To which she said, have you ever tried to get out of a recliner with one arm? You're shoving off to one side. You can't do it very well. And she said, and heaven forbid you have to open a can of anything. She says, I only don't have an electric can opener. All I have is a hand can opener at home. With a broken wrist, it's not going to happen. She never realized how many simple, ordinary tasks require all parts of the body. And it was hard because she couldn't balance her weight on both hands. When even one part we think is the least does not function properly, the whole body is affected. One of the great effects of Paul's analogy is that he neutralizes the ideas of more or less. The total needs of the body eliminate any notion that some parts are more important than others. It's a picture of mutuality and interdependence, an image we can easily apply to the church just as Paul did. Paul carefully framed this analogy because he began by saying, for just as the body is one and has many members, so it is with Christ. He doesn't start off by saying the church, he says it is with Christ. And then says, you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. As members of that body of Christ, we bring gifts and talents the church cannot function without. We truly need each other. Daniel Day Williams is a 20th century theologian who believed that needing one another is what it means to be human. He said, we all have a desire to belong and feel secure in a group which accepts us and gives us the freedom to move as we wish. And when we enter into a relationship with a church, we have a lot of expectations. But among them is the hope that we will be needed and to feel like we belong to a community. The community of the church Williams want, refers to is not just another organization. We're not put here just because, well, we can do good deeds or we can raise money. It's not a business that we try and model after the corporate world. It's not a civic organization. While the community of the church might include aspects of those things, it's more than that. It's a way of living. And Paul suggests that this community, the church itself, is unique because it's a place where members have the same care for one another. When one member suffers, 
all suffer together with him or her. If one member is honored, all rejoice with that person. It sounds like a perfect place to be, but it's not always an easy community to live in. Someone once said, community is the place where the person you least want to live with always lives. It probably wouldn't take us very long to think of someone we think is really a pain in the neck. That person who just gets under your skin and really annoys you. Think for a moment. Could be at work. It could be in your family. Could be anywhere. And imagine that person is living closely with you every hour of the day. In Jesus' community of 12 disciples, he was probably the Judas, the one who would betray him. The frustrating thing is that no matter where you go, you're always going to have a person like that, someone that just annoys you. And you might actually be that person to somebody else. That person is always in your community somewhere, and in the eyes of someone else, well, we all know it can be hard to deal with people who think differently from us or whose personality clashes with ours. But it can also be beautiful if you look upon it as a gift from God and then begin to share your lives. Imagine what it would like to be living in a community where others share your suffering or rejoice with you at times of joy, and they're not exactly like you. Many of you don't have to imagine that community because you found it here in this congregation. But if we're honest, we also know our differences sometimes cause division in the past. There are two thoughts I'd like you to take away today. And the first is that, yes, you, and I by you, I mean this congregation, has been blessed with many gifts that can be used for the good of the congregation, for the community, for the rest of the world. But before you decide you personally can't have any gifts that could possibly be important to share, you do. Because as Paul said, God has given every single person a gift. As part of the community, it's our job to help one another find those gifts sometimes if we don't know what they are. I've had people who said, oh, no, I, I couldn't be an elder. I, I couldn't lead. And then it turns out they're one of the best elders you've ever had. Or same for someone that's a deacon. Or someone that says, oh, there's nothing I can really do to help out. And then the next thing you know, they're back doing plumbing or they're putting up lights here in the sanctuary. People like that that all of a sudden are helpful or people that take a lead out in the community in doing work with the hot lunch or one of the other organizations around. Every person in this room has a special gift. That's why we believe God has brought each person here to share in those gifts together. Remember, the body needs every part in order to function at its peak performance. And the second thought I want you to remember is that while you have your own unique gifts to share, the person next to you or in front of you or behind you or wherever in this congregation also has unique gifts. And sometimes that means that you and that person, your neighbor, will have different ideas on how we as a congregation should operate. Next month we're going to have a visioning day, and you see a flyer for it in your bulletin. And if you don't understand, basically what it is this. You did a mission study before you called Sue and I to this congregation as your co-pastors. The mission study is supposed to say this is who we are and where we want to go as a church. Well, on visioning day, we gather together and we invite everyone. You don't have to be an elder. You don't have to be a deacon. You don't even have to be on one of the teams. But if you want to take part in the conversation, come and join us. And we'll talk about what our vision is. We may sit back and say, you know, we're doing wonderful things just the way they are. Maybe we could do them a little better, but let's do that. Continue to do that. Or maybe somebody will come up and say, you know what? I thought of something we could do that we haven't done before. <gasps> My gosh, something new. Now I happen to know this congregation was founded by people who came to do something new. We might be able to do it yet again. It holds the possibility for us, but with that possibility of the idea of doing something new also has the possibility of conflict. Because we start to look at ideas as someone's being not 
just their idea or my idea, but right idea, wrong idea. Paul reminds us, though, that neither side is wrong or right, and unity doesn't have to mean uniformity. There was a, there was a gentleman who was an elder in a church from the name of Slade Palmer. I know, I, when the first time I heard that name, I thought, oh, it's got to be a made-up name. Well, it's not. He was clerk of session at this congregation, and he'd given a great deal of time and resources to the church. So he was considered one of the pillars of the church. But the church had gotten a little bit smaller. It had decrease in membership. And they decided that it was really no longer logical to continue to have three boards. Because they had the session, a board of deacons, and a board of trustees. And some members proposed that they become what they called unicameral. That they only have the session. They would still have deacons, but they wouldn't have a separate board of trustees. Well, Mr. Palmer was adamantly opposed to this idea. He'd been a trustee for years, and he really believed in the importance of that role, and he was certain that the church would find itself in complete chaos if they tried this. And so, the day of the congregational vote, Mr. Palmer spoke passionately to the congregation, arguing his position with wisdom and experience. He was eloquent, but the congregation voted to follow the suggestion of the recession. And Mr. Palmer saw his ideas defeated. But he wasn't angry. He didn't stomp out and leave the church. He didn't threaten to withhold his pledge. Instead, before the meeting closed, he stood up and spoke one last time to the congregation. He said that while he'd been opposed to the decision and had even voted against it, the unity of the congregation was more important to him than his opinions. That is a rare statement. Therefore, he made a verbal commitment to fully support the decision and to do everything he could to make the transition a smooth one. And 25 years later, the bugs had all been worked out. The structure of the church was fine. It was running smoothly and efficiently. Mr. Palmer died a few years after that congregational meeting. But the story of how he supported that decision of the congregation, even when he disagreed with it, was a legend in that congregation and even in parts of the presbytery. It was a model for officers to follow ever since then because he understood what it meant to have unity in God. You know, you all do a little thing every year when we elect elders. The elders stand up, make all their vows and their promises, and then we turn to the congregation and we say, and do all of you promise to abide by their decisions? And... I know in my heart that there are a few of you who are either don't answer or are hedging your bets, well, maybe some other time, or just plain lie. Because you're not going to completely go along with what the session does, because if you do, well, that means you'd have to give up the opportunity to complain. And Lord knows we don't want to give up. That's one right we don't want to give up. We all like that one. But if we take Corinthians seriously, we have to believe the Holy Spirit works through each one of us, even when we disagree with each other. Then our task is not to determine who's right or who's wrong. Our job is to listen to each other. Listening for the voice of the Holy Spirit as it leads us to maybe even some new ways of doing things, maybe even a new way of being Grace Presbyterian Church. That's no small job, but it's one that we should willingly accept. There are varieties of gifts and ministries and varieties of visions of what our church might look forward to in the future. But there is only one spirit that inspires them all. So we need to work like parts of the body, each member being unique, each one working in concert with the other, each one with a special task but united in ministry. Because when we do that, we really are the body of Christ. One of the ways we respond to what we believe God has done for us is by returning our financial resources, which I'm always hoping are you will be generous in doing so. But just as important are the gifts that you bring in other ways of service. So if you're not involved in service and you're only giving your financial resources, there are things you could do to make a difference in this congregation and the world. Please think about that as you give today.